especially at this unusual time for the Social Science and Policy Forum. Um, this is part of our ongoing series this semester of workshops and lectures um, culminating in a conference that will happen on May 2nd, um, dealing with different facets of immigration to the United States. Our final conference in May will be on um, immigration and metropolitan transformation and revitalization. Um, we've got a really interesting lineup of folks coming. You can get the preview on our webpage, including our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Robert Sampson from Harvard, who's a leading urban sociologist who um, I promise will give you a very interesting presentation. Uh, but I'm expecting a very interesting presentation today, the first part of a double header uh, that the Social Science and Policy Forum is hosting. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'll tell you about the second part of the double header, which is at our usual meeting time, noon to 1.30 tomorrow. Uh, the Social Science and Policy Forum uh, postdoctoral fellow James Walsh will be um, discussing his work with two distinguished commentators, uh, Professor Roger Smith from the Political Science Department uh, and Professor Irene Blumrod, who I'll be introducing in just a moment. Um, that is our usual uh, time, and we will also be serving lunch for any of you who want to join. It'll be a very stimulating uh, uh, afternoon. I should mention it won't be our usual place. Oh, it's not our usual place. Sorry, ma'am. Go ahead. Tell us where it is. Oh, it's in the Meyerson Conference Center in Van Pelt Library. You go into Van Pelt, go up the stairs, and uh, you're right there. Thank you. Um, Meyerson Room in Van Pelt Library, which is a really pleasant room. To get into Van Pelt Library, you'll have to sign in if you don't have a pen ID or bring your pen ID to swipe in. Just heads up on that. So we look forward to seeing many of you tomorrow in what should be a very interesting and lively event. In the meantime, I am delighted to introduce Professor Eileen Blumrod from the University of California at Berkeley. She is uh, Associate Professor of Sociology and the Thomas Garden Barnes Chair of Canadian Studies. And I can say, as someone who grew up um, right across from the uh, Canadian border with the United States, I wish we had a chair in Canadian Studies here at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I think our students uh, would benefit much from that, as well as um, our into uh, the intellectual life of the university. But putting that aside, <laughs> Professor Blumrod uh, works on, the broadly speaking, the question of how Immigrants become incorporated into political bodies and a consequence of their presence on politics uh, and citizenship and understandings of membership. And she's done work on the United States and Canada. She comes to this topic, um, you could say, honestly, or at least out of her own experience. That is, uh, she herself was an immigrant from um, the Netherlands to Canada and then a migrant to the United States, uh, and so has uh, experienced many of the issues that she grapples with in her own very important scholarship. Uh, in her own life. She works on a cluster of related but distinct intellectual questions, including citizenship and multiculturalism, immigrant community organizations, political socialization in mixed status families, uh, and, and more broadly, diversity and democracy. Uh, her uh, works include two edited, important edited collections, as well as uh, her uh, very important and uh, field-defining book, Becoming a Citizen, Incorporating Immigrants and Refugees in the United States and Canada, which was published in 2006. This afternoon, she'll be talking about her work on being American, becoming American, immigrants' membership in the United States. So with no further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, I hope you feel similarly at the end of the talk. <laughs> my applaud then. Um, <laughs> Tom, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and this is work in progress, so I am particularly interested to uh, know people's reactions to what I'm going to be presenting. And as you'll see, uh, this is pretty interdisciplinary work in terms of theoretical background. Um, I am a sociologist. I'm very proud to be a sociologist. Uh, but my undergraduate degree was in political science, and I really like reading a lot of legal and political theory. Um, and for those of you who are sociologists, you'll know that that's unusual in sociology. You know, we're supposed to read Weber, Dirks, and Markheim. Oh, yeah, yeah I'm, making, I'm making new people up. Uh, we're supposed to read Marx, Durkheim, and Weber. Uh, but, you know, questions of um, citizenship or membership or those kind of things, that's considered normative political theory, uh, and it's not really historically been the purview of sociology. Uh, so that's a little bit what I'm hoping to do today, so I, I very much welcome your feedback. Um, let me give you a little bit of background just so that you can 
know a little bit more about how I'm going to situate the project I'm going to present today. Um, as Tom mentioned, uh, these issues of citizenship and political incorporation have been sort of the centerpiece of, of my research. Um, not many people know, but one of the very first things I did on this was membership discourses around the 1995 referendum in Quebec. So this was a moment, this was the second vote in Quebec to secede from Canada and become an independent nation. Uh, currently there is another election in Quebec that might lead to yet another referendum. So these issues are obviously very salient and given the situation in Ukraine, even more salient. Um, and what was interesting then is I was at McGill at the time and the discourses of whether immigrants and their descendants were part of the Quebecois nation was sort of a fascinating entry point into this. Uh, from there, I went on to the dissertation research, which led to the book that Tom mentioned, Becoming a Citizen. Um, the focus, the dependent variable, if we want to use that language, was the actual citizenship level of uh, the Canada and the United States and whether immigrants became citizens as well as other things. Um, so that led to these questions of membership as well, and more recently I've done a number of different papers with large and quantitative sets uh, with co-authors looking at immigrant political incorporation across 18, sometimes more, sometimes less, nations uh, in the developed world. So mostly Western Europe, US, Canada, sometimes Australia. Um, what I'm going to present today though is very American focused, and I'm happy to sort of think broader about this, but this is American focused. Um, and here, what I'm interested in doing is sort of extending these thoughts about membership um, and citizenship and thinking about it in a context in the United States where you have the diversity of legal statuses that we do for, for foreign-born. Um, so obviously undocumented, legal permanent, but also temporary, naturalized citizen, U.S.-born citizen and the legal consciousness that that might or might not provide. Now there's been research on legal consciousness in terms of uh, undocumented immigrants, especially young people. Uh, in the California context, people have written about how having AB 540 status, which is the status that young undocumented folks have when they apply for admission into the universities of the University of California system or the California state system, has given them a sense of legal consciousness that they use against a stigma of illegality. So this idea of how does the law shape our sense of membership and belonging. Now, another part of this obviously is, is citizenship as, as a status. And here you can think more broadly about, you know, does citizenship actually even matter given a lot of research in sociology where we think about second class citizenship. So who cares about legal status given the inequalities that there might be because of race, class, gender, sexuality, etc. Um, and thinking through this for, the, for the, the case of immigrants and mixed status families, I want to draw from three somewhat distinct uh, traditions. So first is political and legal theory. And I'll tell you right up front that I'm really nervous with Rogers and Peter Spiro sitting right there because they've written a lot on this. So we'll see if they can correct all my mistakes on this end. Um, another tradition that I want to draw on is comparative political science, political sociology. Most of this is done in the European context where people are comparing nations and thinking through the contours of belonging through legal systems or policy or nationhood. And then a third literature is the sociology of immigration, which in the US context, I would argue, is pretty parochial. Um, it only really studies the United States, and the central question for sociology up to quite recently has been assimilation. Um, and people debate whether that term is appropriate or not, but the, the question of interest are, are immigrants and their descendants integrating into American society? Um, and that has led to a particular framework for thinking of integration. So I want to try to bring those three into conversation. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I first want to go through some of this theoretical background and try to weave these three things together to set up the project and some of the findings. Um, then I'll tell you a little bit about the project, which is based on qualitative interviews with uh, mixed status families in the Bay Area of San Francisco in California. Uh, and then, depending on time, um, I might talk a little bit about some of the distinctions between the groups that we study. It, it, we'll see how far. I'm going to try to keep an eye on time. I can go on sometimes. Um, in terms of theorizing membership, uh, there's a long tradition, I think, of, of thinking about the United States, and here I'm quoting Peter Schuck and Roger Smith, um, 
of thinking about the United States in terms of consensual civic citizenship, and not just the United States. This is a type of, you could maybe think of a sort of a liberal or social contract type citizenship, where it's valued because it's an affirmative choice by the individual, regardless of background, to join a political body, right? So the voluntary adherence, rather than a passive or imputed allegiance, was the connective tissue that would bind together the new polity. This is specifically related to uh, the creation of the um, an independent American Republic, but you can think of this in terms of the French Revolution and a lot of other moments where people are trying to form a nation out of civic bonds. In opposition to this, again, citing Roger Smith, uh, you can think of a strong, ascriptive Americanism, right? So this is the name. This is the notion that, well, that's nice. This might have been the ideals of the American War of Independence and the New Republic, but the reality was far from it. We only have to think of slavery, most obviously, but you can think of all kinds of other cultural, religious, ethnic, gender, and racial hierarchies that made some people non-citizens in terms of, say, the Dred Scott decision in terms of federal citizenship, the Chinese Exclusion Act that barred Chinese immigrants from ever being able to naturalize in their lifetime, um, but all kinds of other secondary uh, distinctions that led to these discourses of second-class citizenship. So there's a robust uh, political and legal theorizing about the nature of American belonging is it ascriptive? Is it civic? Is it both? You know, then you can have debates about liberal and republican variants, but it's sort of like, what is the nature of the bonds between people in the United States? And it's not just the United States, so this is where the comparative political sociology and political science comes in, because this notion of the ethnic versus the civic, you know, was probably uh, most well-known articulated by Rogers Brubaker in his comparison of France and Germany, so France being the civic political belonging, Germany being the national belonging, and the argument that n stories of nationhood and ideals of, of the nation led to particular legal traditions, led to particular citizenship laws, and led to particular treatments whereby immigrants were incorporated into the nation in different ways. Um, in its strongest form, in the German case, your ties to membership were based on blood and ethnicity and descent, so immigrants could never become part of the nation or it was very, very difficult to do so. And then in the French case, it was again this idea of a revolution, a political allegiance. All you had to do was sort of uh, adhere to the values of the French Revolution, the Constitution, etc. So since the 90s, this is largely the, the, the language from the 1990s, I think, in terms of academic scholarship, What's been interesting is that this has been this has persisted, this ethnic and civic distinction has persisted, and as I'm going to argue in a little while, you can see it really strongly when you look at the quantitative research being done about national identities. So if you look at things such as the General Social Survey, the European Social Survey, and other instruments that we use to sort of see what is the nature of Americanness, many people have continued to use ethnic and civic as sort of a dividing line and then have items that might map onto one or the other. Now, in this mixture between the civic and the ethnic, birthright citizenship occupies a really interesting place. Um, and it's an interesting place for the following reason. Most of the people who criticize an ethnic nation, a notion of citizenship or membership do so because it's beyond your control. Right? You are born into the nation, and especially from the immigrant's point of view, you can never enter that nation, nation if you don't have that ancestry. So it's seen as an exclusionary device. And that contrasts with the civic notion, which is supposed to be inclusive and is one of the ways that in the United States, historically, the idea was that you would give relatively easy naturalization, at least to white immigrants, and therefore they would become part of the, the nation, the, the citizenship and also membership. Um, when Rogers Brubaker was comparing France and Germany, though, he didn't put that much emphasis on the naturalization. It was part of the story. Uh, but a lot of the emphasis was on birthright citizenship based on birth on the territory. And uh, in Brubaker's account, you know, vis-a-vis -vis immigrants, the French citizenry is defined expansively as a territorial community. And of course, from the perspective of having ethnicity as a determinant of membership, birth on territory is rather inclusive because at least it breaks sort of an intergenerational 
uh, pattern of exclusion. So you can think of, say, you know, intergenerational economic mobility, a child is affected by their parents' education and income. Uh, you could think about the same thing in terms of a lot of intergenerational transfers. But when it comes to legal status citizenship, if you have absolute birthright citizenship on a territory, you break sort of the, the possible case-like status between the parents who might not have citizenship or even not have documents and be clandestine, and then the children who automatically get that citizenship and then at least legal inclusion. So from Brubaker's perspective, birthright citizenship was quite expansive and inclusive. However, where you're born is completely beyond your control and is ascriptive in a very similar way, in fact even more, you could say, than race or gender or class, where there are at least some small notions of boundary crossing or some you know, possibilities of passing in some cases, where you were born, unless you start falsifying documents, uh, is just the fact of where you were born. So another way of thinking about this is to say that birthright citizenship is actually extremely futile, uh, and it's a very sort of uh, non-liberal uh, sort of idea. So in a polity whose chief organizing principle was and is the liberal individualistic idea of consent, talking about the United States, mere birth within a nation's border seems to be an anomalous, inadequate measure. So, you know, what do you do with birthright citizenship? Um, where do we see it? It is completely and utterly ascriptive, but from the point of view of immigration, at least across generations, it can be inclusive. And one of the things that I have found really fascinating in, in the work that I do is that the pure liberal or sort of maybe even just theoretical argument against birthright citizenship makes a lot of sense as a theoretical exercise. And especially if you take a global perspective, as various authors have, um, it is completely uh, you know, maybe illegitimate or immoral that someone who just happened to be born in the United States can benefit from its citizenship and then all of the things that flow from citizenship, whereas if you were born in the Sudan, you are stuck with your birth in the Sudan and you can't access U.S. territory and all of the things related to the labor market, educational systems, healthcare systems, etc. So people have talked about sort of the, the, the immorality and, and, and illiberal character of birthright citizenship. If you take the perspective, though, of an immigrant in the United States, um, it is the way to get into the nation, and what is maybe potentially troubling for some are moves in the United States to try to get rid of the protections of the 14th Amendment for the children born of immigrant parents. Um, you know, this is one button uh, that uh, is part of sort of this repeal of the 14th Amendment uh, move. Um, there's some more egregious ones. Um, in terms of uh, challenging the idea that people born in the United States should have citizenship. And so we're stuck between something that maybe as a theoretical exercise um, has a lot of, uh, uh, you know, sort of logical consequences and, and sort of makes sense, but as an actual practical, you know, what, what, is, it, what is it like on the ground, it could have all kinds of uh, problematic repercussions. So. That's sort of the political theory and, and, and some of the comparative politics. Turn to sociology of immigration. Um, slowly but surely, American scholars of immigration have started looking comparatively. Um, and as they do so, they're also trying to theorize the sociocultural member, sort of boundaries of membership. So they're taking a boundary approach. Um, you can think of uh, a long time ago, the anthropology of Frederick Barth, more recently people like Lamont and others, about this boundary approach, sort of where do we draw the boundaries of who's in and out. Um, back in 1999, Ari Zolberg and um, Wun, his co-author, uh, talked about language and religion juxtaposing the United States and Europe, talking about the fact that they thought the two were quite, they operated in similar ways. Um, and then more recently, Richard Alba has made the argument that we want to think about immigrant integration as boundary crossing or boundary moving across things like language, religion, race, and citizenship. So the sociologists working on this question are going beyond ethnicity versus civic. They sort of put the civic in the citizenship. They don't theorize it very well, I would say. Um, and then on the other side, they're talking about ascription through race, but they're adding in some variables that we might call sociocultural, uh, language and religion. Um, and these get very difficult because they're not ascriptive um, in the same sense as something like race, right? Like you can learn multiple languages, but it's not necessarily easy, and you might always have an accent. So there's still markers, 
but there are opportunities for crossing. Religion's a little bit more difficult. Most monotheic religions really only want you to have one, um, so it's a little bit harder to do the multiplicity there. And so the question becomes, where does legal status come in here and how does it play? Um, this leads to the research questions that at least are animating some of the writing that I'm doing currently. So how do immigrants and their children understand membership in the United States? How does this vary across, na across, national, uh, across national origin groups and legal statuses? And then how does legality and law shape conceptions of membership? So I don't, I don't know how many people here do immigration as their bread and butter. So I apologize in advance if this is old news to you. Um, if you look at the total foreign-born population in the United States, uh, about 36% are citizens, a little bit less than a third are legal permanent residents. There's a debate about how many people are undocumented. It could be 28, could be 29, could be 30, uh, but roughly around there. And then there's about 3% who are temporary. So they are legally present in the United States, but they're on a visa that does not allow them to stay past the limits of their visa. So you can think of international students, people on H-1B visas, etc. Uh, the number of unauthorized grew during the 1990s through to the early 2000s, has leveled off. Um, you don't see it here because I just did 2005, 2010. It dipped down during the economic recession, uh, and the latest numbers I've seen out of the Pew put it back at around maybe close to 12 million again. So it was at 12 million, went down during the recession, maybe back at 12 million. Um, but this is sort of the broad trend. Um, because the last, uh, or the, well, the, big, the big amnesty of 1986, the Immigration Reform and Control Act, was back in 1986, the people who have come since then, or the people who did not get legalized in 1986, have had children. Uh, many of them have entered into unions and family arrangements with people with different statuses. And so we have this growing uh, population of mixed status families where families hold different legal statuses. And especially in a place like California, you have uh, a large number of people who are in this. Um, these are estimates, uh, and you know, they're as good as the estimates are, but these are, these are pretty decent estimates. Looking at um, families with children under 18, uh, the California population looks about like this. Uh, and you'll see that 14% of uh, the child is a citizen, but the parent is probably undocumented, or at least one parent is undocumented. Um, and then you also have another 21% where the child is a citizen and uh, a parent or two parents are legal permanent residents but non-citizens. So you have a third of kids growing up in California in households where they might have citizenship, but their parents do not. And uh, so one of things that I was really interested in is what does that mean for kids? Like does that mean that they don't learn about politics, that they don't learn civic engagement, that the parents can't teach them, or does it mean that they sort of overcompensate, that they want to speak for their parents? Um, so th this, this fact that we have the legal statuses and the mixed legal statuses uh, I think is really fascinating and we haven't quite had that um, historically, or at least not until say you know, maybe a hundred years ago when you think of some of the Asian migrants who were probably in a similar situation where U.S. born kids had citizenship but their parents were ineligible for naturalization. Uh, the research that I'm going to present looks at uh, families from, uh, with Mexican origins, Chinese origins, and Vietnamese origins. Um, you don't have to worry too much about all these statistics, this is just to give you a background. Um, but one of the reasons I picked these three communities is because at the community level, their experience with the immigration system and sort of how we think about their legality is quite different. Um, in the Vietnamese case, uh, the first two waves, three waves of Vietnamese largely came under refugee provisions or various specialized visa categories recognizing uh, the U.S. role in the war in Southeast Asia and sort of the special relationship between Vietnam and the United States. Since then, there's been much more family reunification through regular channels, but there's sort of a refugee uh, sense of legality to the Vietnamese community. Um, in the Chinese case, it's very mixed. A lot of different people coming in through different uh, types of statuses, economic, family reunification, refugees in terms of one-child policy or religious persecution, and then some unauthorized, especially in cities such as San Francisco. And then the Mexican community in California is interesting because actually the majority are born in the U.S. 
Um, so if you look at people who are of Mexican origin, uh, Californians forget this, um, but you know most of them are U.S. born. Um, but if you look at the non or sorry, the foreign born, then you get relatively few naturalized citizens and much higher proportions of undocumented status. Um, I and a, a team of graduate students and undergraduate students uh, interviewed U.S. born citizen youth between the ages of 14 and 18 years old. Uh, we largely sampled in San Francisco, San Jose, Richmond, and Oakland. We were particularly trying to get families that were a very modest uh, socioeconomic background because one of the questions was how do you learn about politics and civic engagement and I was basically interested in at-risk youth, the youth who are going to have the hardest time potentially um, with some of these things. We interviewed for every single teen that we interviewed, we interviewed at least one parent. Um, and the parents had different legal statuses. Some were undocumented, some were legal permanent residents, some were naturalized, some, a few were U.S. born. We didn't get as many uh, U.S. born. Whoops. Um, and there were two phases of interviewing. Um, this was funded by the Russell Sage Foundation. There was a pilot uh, set of interviews in 2006 during the immigration rights marches. So I can also talk a little bit about that in 2006. And then we went back and we re-interviewed Mexican families in 2008 and we added on the Chinese and Vietnamese interviews then. All right, let me justify the qualitative interviewing. I know that for hopefully the sociologists, that's okay, I'm allowed to do qualitative interviewing, um, but it's not always the case, especially among the political scientists. Uh, so let me take 30 seconds to sort of justify this. If we think about these notions of membership, if you think of this civic identity argument, uh, the way this has generally been analyzed when we wanna know what people think, uh, is through asking questions about your actions. Do you vote? Do you volunteer, etc.? And then, of course, their feelings. Do you feel loyal? Do you feel attached to the United States? Do you feel American, etc.? Um, and on the GSS, the General Social Survey, you will find questions that basically map onto a civic notion of membership. Um, in terms of ascriptive identity, uh, we can think of birthplace, religious background, ancestry, and race, and the General Social Survey asks you questions about how important is it for being truly American that you were born in the United States, that you have American ancestry, which is an interesting idea in itself, uh, that you are Christian. Um, and then there's the ambiguous markers such as English language ability, and I call it ambiguous because some people can argue that it is civic, because in order to have a robust civic sphere and political sphere, people need to talk with each other, and so you need a common language. Other people see it as more ascriptive, a little bit more as a marker of race um, and ethnicity, potentially. So this is how we have been mapping the ascriptive civic or ethnic civic uh, ideas into the general social survey. I was curious how ordinary immigrants actually think about this. Like it, when, when you talk to them and you ask them these kind of questions, what are the things that come to their mind when you ask, are you an American? What makes an American? What do you think of when you hear the word American? Um, and I wanted to sort of see whether there were ideas out there that we might not be tapping through, through the survey research. So we asked a whole host of questions about civic and political learning and engagement, and I'll talk today about the questions we asked about being American, a little bit on good citizenship, not as much, and about identity. So here are some of the qualitative interviewing results. Um, first of all, when you ask immigrants and their US-born young kids, teenagers, um, what does it mean to be American? You definitely hear stories of civic inclusion, sort of a civic notion of membership. So I'll give you some examples. So the question we asked, what does it mean to be American? Open-ended question, whatever you want to answer. Uh, and so here's a, a US born Chinese American parent, and then someone who lives in America, I'm gonna laugh, someone who lives in America and has the, um, can appreciate the ideals that are appreciated with a country that has freedom of speech and everything else. A lot of people didn't really know what to say. It, it was a question that they hadn't necessarily thought about, and, and so you can see that this person is thinking out loud, and a lot of people thought out loud as we asked this question. Um, here are two teens, one of Mexican origin, one of Chinese origin. Um, freedom of speech was something that a lot of people mentioned, and I, I was surprised. I hadn't. I hadn't thought that this would matter so much. But a lot of people mention this, and I don't know if this is just because they're getting it in their civics classes, that this is something you're supposed to say, or if there's something deeper about this. 
Um, but you know, freedom of speech, being able to do the things you want to do, an opportunity to pursue your dreams, stuff like that. Uh, getting into problems that are going on in the state, voting, helping people out. Um, so you know, this, this is very much in line with the civic notion of membership. There's nothing about your background, there's nothing about sort of ascriptive qualities. Um, we also, though, heard a lot of responses that talked about race. Um, and I have to say that I was actually surprised about how much we got. And maybe this is my position as an invisible white immigrant to the United States that I didn't think sufficiently enough about this, and I should have. Um, but I was struck by how much race came in. Um, and I have no idea if this is California. I mean, we're talking San Francisco, which is supposedly a pretty progressive place. Um, so, uh, you know, it would be interesting to know whether this uh, applies other places as well. But, you know, we asked the same uh, general question, what does it mean to be an American? And there were, there were more than one, let's say, a teen who would just say, a white person. That was what an American was. Um, and then a naturally, naturalized Vietnamese American parent, they, my sons, don't look like Americans, their bodies, they don't look like Americans. Um, and so there was this language of race and sort of an ascriptive quality of American. Um, I don't have time to talk about the comparison between American and what does it mean to be a citizen, because we also asked that, and so I'm also thinking through how those things might be scripted slightly differently. Um, but this was the American, and the American was scripted, was scripted more in people's minds as, as race. But the other thing that came out was that there was a notion of class and privilege, which in some ways intersected with race. And it was hard to sometimes tease those things apart. Um, so a U.S. born Mexican American parent said, what does it mean to be an American? Fulfilling the American dream, your family, your house, a job, that's to me what American is. I figure most people picture Americans with money, white. Uh, a Mexican American teen. Like when they say that it's white and like being higher in everything, money and more rights. Um, so the notion of race is here. But it's a notion of a particular race and, and sort of class, or at least economic condition status that are overlaid. You can think of sort of the white middle class, or maybe even upper middle class in, in, in certain respects. Um, and this was, this was surprising because, at least from my reading of the survey-based research, people have not asked this question, uh, you know, in order to be American, do you have to have a house? In order to be American, do you have to make an income over $45,000 or whatever it would be? I assume most people would say no, just because if you were asked that in a survey situation, you might recoil against it. Um, but it would be interesting to see because the perception, at least from the immigrants and their kids, was that there was a marker of economic consideration when you t thought about being American, at least for some of them. Uh, cultural practices and acculturation were also very important. This is not surprising to scholars of immigration and sociology. We talk about this all the time. I don't think the political scientists talk about this sufficiently. So the sort of the, the, the dichotomy between civic and ethnic maybe elides some sort of mushy middle ground where there are cultural practices and are the cultural practices civic or are they racially tinged or, or what's going on. Um, language is clearly important. So a Mexican-American teen said, I think of my parents as more Mexican than Americans because they were born over there and they know more about it and stuff and they don't really speak English well. Um, and her parents were naturalized U.S. citizens. So in terms of a legal status, they were citizens. But in, in her imagining of American, they weren't American. This uh, was an interview done with a gentleman who was naturalized speaking to uh, an interviewer or, an interviewer who uh, is a Vietnamese American woman, a graduate, or used to be a graduate student in the department. Um, she speaks fluent Vietnamese, was doing the interview, asks about being American, and then this was the answer. Um, you are very American. You are a strong woman. Vietnamese women are just more delicate with their bodies. They are soft. They know where to sit at the table, and when they talk, they talk with a softer voice. Um, and so this is really an embodiment of, of American in, in a pure embodiment sense, right? So he was judging how she was reacting and, you know, knowing this student, um, I don't think she's particularly aggressive in her manner. Um, probably, you know, I, I, anyway, she's not particularly aggressive in her manner. I'm not going to go further than that because I'm going to say horrible cultural stereotypes. Um, but she's not particularly aggressive in her manner, but from the perspective of this gentleman, she was not 
doing the codes of gender performance that he would expect in a Vietnamese woman. Uh, so there is this notion of cultural practices in becoming American. Um, here is another naturalized Chinese American parent. We Chinese don't usually call the police. Like when they got robbed, they, uh, this person was talking about um, a brother uh, and his wife um, who got robbed. They don't want to get into troubles. Being an American means being brave to go out and do things. So sort of a very positive valuation of Americanness. Um, and then a Vietnamese American teen, this is maybe more banal, but still relevant. Being American is eating American food, which usually if you push them would be like hamburgers, McDonald's. Um, hanging around with American people and doing the American way. Um, and when we pushed on like, what is the American way, it was a very thin notion of Americanness. It was like wearing jeans, um, you know, going to the 4th of July, even then they weren't really quite sure. But there was this sense that there's something out there that's American. So a lot of this, remember again, the people we were interviewing um, tended to come from modest socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, their parents were immigrants or they themselves were immigrants. There, were, there was quite a lot of sense of potential exclusion or actual exclusion from society. There was not a strong sense of membership. And what was interesting also to see were sort of the defensive moments where people did claim being American or did claim membership. So sort of the practices by which you both felt excluded, but at the same time would make claims against others or claims against the potential exclusions that you thought were out there. Um, and one of the things, if you think of culture as being potentially exclusionary, I don't fit the American ideal, whatever that ideal might be in someone's mind, the response to that was defensive multiculturalism or defensive diversity. So here's a Chinese American teen. I think like being American doesn't necessarily mean to be white, right? So there's the race again. Like if you grew up here, you grew up in a very diverse place. You interact with a lot of diverse people. And if it wasn't this diverse, it wouldn't really be America. So I think what's interesting is the teen is upholding a sense of diversity as American, but it only makes sense because it is juxtaposed against this other sense of America, which is being white. Um, and so a Mexican American teen says, the image that I identify with being, with, I, I identify with being American is, of course, a white person, but it is a mix of cultures. So again, there's this language or a trope of diversity uh, that is out there that people can use against these potential exclusions, but the exclusions exist. The same thing became evident on the economic basis. Um, this is a young man who lives um, actually not far from my house in Richmond. Um, and Richmond now is safer than when we did the interviews, but at the time we were doing the interviews, Richmond was one of the top 10 murder capitals in the United States, when you think of murder per capita. Um, and so he was talking about being American, what does it mean to be an American, and his answer was American. They live in quiet areas. Most of them have bought their homes. They live peacefully, not in places where there are shootings at every hour. Where they live, nothing like that happens. So, Here's very much exclusion um, in terms of the safety of your neighborhood, uh, your ability to have a house, etc. If you know anything about the Bay Area geography, the closer you get to the water, at least in the East Bay, the closer you're to the sort of like the flatlands, that's where the poorer areas are. The higher you get in the hills, that's where the richer areas are. Sort of the reverse of Rio, I guess. Um, so for this person, you'd look up into the hills to see where the true Americans live. So this, this is one sense of, of class or economic condition or maybe safety as exclusion. But in some cases, young people in particular, and sometimes their parents, used economic contribution as a way to um, tap Americanness, especially when their parents were undocumented. Right? So they are legally excluded from being American in a, in, a, in a sort of pure legal sense or formal sense. But they would use language um, to, to claim Americanism. And it wasn't just the Mexicans, but it was it was more prevalent among Mexicans. Um, so the Vietnamese American teen, to be considered an American, um, just work like an American. So the notion that you have to be working in order to be American. And then another Mexican, uh, sorry, Mexican American teen, well, to me, being American, I guess, is like living in America and working in America. Even if you are undocumented, you are still American. You are still paying taxes and all. So again, a, a dual notion, sort of Janice faced, you can be both excluded based on your economic condition, but economic appeals might be a way to claim Americanness in this way. And then birthright citizenship. So this is sort of where I want to maybe, and maybe I'll get to some national origin differences too, but um, in this debate around 
the Fourteenth Amendment and uh, you know whether well not the fact that birthright citizenship is ascriptive and how sort of illiberal that is or problematic that could be. What was very striking in the interviews, especially with the teens, but not just with the teens, is how the access to citizenship through territorial birth became an absolute sort of claim that people could use against the potential exclusions. So if you think of race hierarchies or if you think of class hierarchies where you might be stratified, sort of the equality of being born in the United States was a way to potentially stand against such exclusions. And in some cases, especially the teens, they hadn't thought much about it. So when we asked them, you know, what makes an American, they kind of went, well, to be born here. Like, you know, that was, it was sort of, sort of obvious. Well, of course, I was born here. Um, and, you know, I'm not entirely sure all of the things that might be packed into what it means to be born here. I mean, it could be, I was born here, I am a citizen of the United States. It could be, I was born here and I went to school here and I have all my friends here and I speak English fluently. So it could be also an acculturation story. Um, but clearly there was something about birth on the territory that mattered. Um, and I'm going to give you a quote that, that's particularly poignant about this. So, what does it mean to be American? It means being born here, maybe. She's thinking about this. Um, for me, Americans are the white people, the gabachos. They are Americans, but the people born here are Mexican Americans, and they have Mexican parents. They too, even if they're not white, they too are Americans, Mexican Americans, right? So she's thinking aloud in terms of like, you know, what really makes an American? Um, a teen, well, like being born, I am US born. Well, I was born here, but I feel like I'm Mexican, and other people see me as Mexican. Like if a white girl sees me, she'll say, oh yeah, she's Mexican, even though I was born here. Um, so this language of birthplace is sort of a trump card, potentially, about possible exclusions. So in terms of thinking and theorizing about membership, in the sociology of immigration, people have talked about language, religion, race, citizenship. In our interviews, religion did not come up. Um, now, this might be just because of the groups we chose. Uh, so almost all of our Mexicans were Christian, most were Catholic, there were a number of evangelical Protestants uh, in our sample. Um, among the people of Chinese origin, um, many didn't practice uh, a formal religion or they had sort of ancestor worship in the home. Some of them were also Christian. The Vietnamese were either Buddhist or Christian, Catholic usually. Um, so we didn't have, we didn't have anyone who was Hindu or Muslim uh, or Jewish. So this might not just come up for them, uh, given the, the, the religious makeup of the United States. Language came up, religion did not come up, race came up. Citizenship was important, but it was birthright citizenship. Uh, naturalization was undermined by almost everybody, both the teens who didn't see their parents as true Americans even if they were naturalized, and by the naturalized immigrants themselves who still didn't necessarily consider themselves American because it was more of an identity. Culture was important, but it was relatively thin. And then economic condition or contribution. So as we think forward about maybe trying to see how generalizable these results are beyond you know, the Bay Area and the sample that we have, I think it would be interesting to try to probe some of these economic considerations. Um, I also think it would be interesting to think a little bit more about distance from boundaries and sort of the processes of boundaries and claims making. So we can think of race, economic condition, culture and language, legal status as both ways of excluding people but also potential rhetorical strategies or um, ways of making claims that can be inclusive. And so there's this sense that Americans are white, but there's a multiracial America that you can appeal to. There's a sense that Americans have a middle class lifestyle and economic security, but those who work hard can be American. So it can even be a claim for people without legal status. There's cultural distance due to language and behaviors, but there is this sense of sort of an open culture. And then there's the illegality that is working and birthright citizenship, which is much more important, at least in the interviews we did, than naturalization. Um, I'm going to end by thinking a little bit about how this process might be slightly different for our Chinese and Vietnamese respondents than for the people of Mexican origin. And this is actually something that I'm doing the analysis on as we speak, so I would very much welcome your thoughts. Um, but looking at the way people of uh, Vietnamese and Chinese background, and I'm sorry I use the term Asian because I realize that covers a huge continent, but um, it fit on the slide, which is not a great reason. Um, but the Chinese and Vietnamese uh, uh, respondents, they saw a lot of this difference between what could be called the mainstream or sort of the majority as a racial cultural difference. A lot of the language was around this. But a lot was put in together with this. And 
this is an exchange that I really like, and I realize that I, you know, I picked the one that I really like, but it gets, brings together so many of these discourses. So this is a young uh, Vietnamese American teen. In your mind, what does it mean to be American? Um, I guess just if they have a job, a house, a family, so a very sort of economic notion, I guess they are American. Thinks a little bit more. I guess you're only American if you were born here. So that's a little bit different. If you're a naturalized citizen, then you're just a person who came here. Now his parents are naturalized citizens. Do you think of your parents as American? Not really. Why not? Because, I don't know, they don't do anything American culture. Uh, they are just Asian. I mean, American is like anything a white person does. Basically, you know, have dinner with the whole family at the dinner table. <laughs> you know, that would be fascinating to know how many white Americans in the San Francisco Bay Area have dinner with the whole family at the dinner table. Yeah. yeah, just anything a white person does. And my parents don't do any of that. Um, so you can see all of these different layers that come together. And you know, one of the nice things I think with qualitative interviewing is you can see the multi-stranded nature of how people think through this rather than the survey data where you have to check a box and you can maybe check a few different boxes, but you don't get the same sort of interplay. But what I do think is interesting is this fact that the distance is something about race and culture and that it could maybe be spanned by birthplace, maybe by economics, but that's the main dividing line. For Mexicans, the legal situation of the community is very prevalent. Even if the person themselves is documented, and even sometimes if their parents are documented, the sense of illegality looming over the community really imbues the way they talk about these things. And I'll only present the data on American, but it's even more apparent when you ask about what does it mean to be a citizen. Um, and I, we can talk more about that in question and answer. But for now, again, this is a striking quote, um, but it sort of captures a lot of different things. What does it mean to be an American? I am both American and Mexican. But my brother is always like, oh, you're an American and you are like white. But he's playing around. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm a Chicana, I'm both. And then he just gets angry at the fact that I am going to be able to drive with permission and he is not because he is not legal and he is almost 19. Um, and I think, you know, this is a, somewhat of an exceptional quote, but it really speaks to the fact that in, in the brother's eyes, at least as recounted by this young woman, legal status whitens you. And so you become white through your legal status. And so this tends to be a little bit more um, the notion of belonging and difference that you see among some of the Mexican respondents. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we have lots of time for questions uh, and comments, so um, please take your way. Uh, uh, to take your own sure. questions? Okay, great. And if you can identify yourself um, so that she knows she knows many of you, but not everyone, so please. Mm -hmm. One of the comments toward the end, just now. Mm -hmm. There are 50,000 illegal Irishmen in the New York City area. The family it was about, oh, you, you're like, or something about white people. Mm -hmm. Like that's there right. aren't any white, like everybody that's white is American. And that you're not, that, but now I'm just a person. I'm a northern born, urban, and I'm Catholic. A friend of mine who's now deceased, going back, this is 40 years, we're friends, was southern born, rural, and Protestant. And all through our friendship, this kind of stuff went on. Mm -hmm. My friend was always saying to me, well, now, do you really think that those people who come from where they speak Spanish, Latin American, do you think they really could become Americans? I said, yes, they really could. They could move here, and they could settle down, and they could have children, and their children would be American citizens by birth. And that's what happens when you come to America, largely. Whether you go to Canada or whether you come to the United States, you sort of become North Americanized, or whatever you want to call it. And then he went on about the Asians. I said, would you please get over it? He said, well, do you think they could really be loyal? I said, yes, I think they could really be loyal. Read the history of the Second World War. And he could not get in his head, because he never went west of the Mississippi. He could not get into his head till we traveled in the western states, particularly the southwest. Then he said, well, who are all these brown people? I mean, he knew they were intellectually, but he could not grasp. Because to him, all these black people that came over as slaves, and 
our American citizens, of course, he, he saw this binary. You're either northern or southern, and you're either black or white, but you're surely American. But everybody else is questionable. And it just makes me laugh that he could do this very kind of stuff from our point of view out. I, I, I constantly, and of course over the years, he, when, when he finally went west, he began to open up in a whole different way. So I thought it was so amusing that, I, anyway, I just wanted to say those two things about people's perception of who other people are is so, it's something wrong all over the world. About well, and, you know, most, most of the literature that's looked at notions of Americanness or a national identity using social, the, the survey data, has been of nationally representative thousand people surveys where people do not make distinctions between immigrants and non-immigrants and largely just because of the population of the United States the vast majority of the people who respond are US born citizens um, and so a lot of the attention has been on that so this is slightly different putting more attention on immigrants and the children of immigrants De Debbie Schildkraut has done a few studies where she is over she is over sampled on people of ethnic and racial minorities to sort of try to get both sides of the story in terms of what people think. Um, and some of her conclusions are that the way people think about American, at least when it's considered as ethno-racial background, are not that different. Now these are sort of large national representative uh, samples, so the local dynamics of diversity will clearly matter, and, and that'll be interesting to think about, like, you know, how the Bay Area might be different or the same as other places. Just another question? I, let me just get another question. California, just, the pardon? Mexicans who have been here since 1500. Yeah, but, you know, the vast majority of, of people of Mexican origin have come in the 20th and 21st century. The number of people who were incorporated when the U.S. took over parts of Mexico is still relatively small. Most of them are still descendants of migrants, even if you go back to their first generation. Yeah. So I have a question with regards to this conversions that you're seeing of racialization and legal status. Mm -hmm. um, and so from what I understand, at least, you saw the Mexican teens talking about racialization, they're themselves as racialized minorities, even though they're not really a minority in California. Right. And, in a, and differently from the way that the Chinese and Vietnamese teens did. Could you talk about that? Sure. Difference? So, I, race clearly mattered to both the Vietnamese and the Chinese origin teens and parents, and it mattered to the people of Mexican origin. So there was this sense that based on phenotype, skin color, eyes, hair, that there was a distance between what was prototypically American, which was understood as a white person, and themselves. So race was, was clearly an issue for all of the three communities. Um, what was interesting is the overlap of what race meant beyond just phenotype. So um, in the Mexican case, um, it did have this overlap with um, we're looked down upon, we're Latino, we're brown, and it, and it was implicated with we're seen as undocumented, the community seen as illegal, there's this perception of us in this way, and then a perception of um, criminalization, right? The discourse around the illegal immigrant and they broke the laws to come here. Um, and so I didn't, I didn't show the differences between the American, the responses to what is an American and what is a U.S. citizen. Um, some of it overlapped. But one of the things that was different for the Mexicans is the Mexicans, when asked what makes a good American citizen, or sorry, U.S. citizen, we're very careful, what makes a good U.S. citizen, um, a lot of it had to do with being law-abiding. Being law-abiding, of good moral character. And if you think about like adjustment of status forms or N400 forms in terms of becoming naturalized, they were replicating a lot of that language. So it was like you have to be a good moral character, you have to be law-abiding, you can't use government benefits, um, so it was almost a very sort of defensive understanding of the legal contours. And, you know, I was not clairvoyant enough to realize that this was going on during the interviewing, because ideally what I would have loved to do is probe a little bit, like, where are these ideas coming from? Is it just, you know, talking amongst each other? Is it like, remember this is 2006 during the marches, like, was it coming from the radio, what you had to do in order to become, you know, to do an adjustment of status or something? Is it just known in the community? Um, but there was this sort of consciousness, I would say, about how 
uh, the legal status of people are constructed. Whereas for the Chinese and the Vietnamese, the race was really overlaid with cultural or language markers. So their parents weren't American, not just because they didn't look American, but because they did all these things that weren't American. And then with the, the kid status, they felt very am ambiguous uh, or ambivalent sometimes. So, some of them were unabashedly American. Some of them were like, yeah, I'm American. Like, there was no question in their minds. But some of them were sort of ambivalent because it was like, well, no, I'm treated as an Asian. I'm not American, but yes, I am American because I do all these things that my parents don't do. So they sort of saw themselves in this in-between place, but it was culture and race that together became the marker. And then the economics I highlight because it could overlay with race, as you've seen, um, but in some cases it was used sort of to claim membership. So I'm still sort of thinking through what that means and how to think about it. Yeah, John. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for this, uh, which I think is really important research questions, and I really appreciate the method and, and feel like you should, you know, <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> champion it and, and not feel like you have to uh, to to to. to with caveats around it uh, by any means. Uh, I'm sort of following up on, on that point you just made, which is where does this come from? Um, and earlier in your talk, you said something to the effect of there's a young man who, when he looks up in the hills, he sees that is whiteness. Right. That is the white American up there. And I, I'm wondering, and, and maybe my disciplinary background, I'm from communication and media studies, is, is pushing me here uh, into a place that I, I'm not sure you've thought about a lot, which is maybe he's not looking up into the hills, but maybe he's turning on the TV. TV. Yeah. Um, and and I, I feel like there's a, for me, there's an elephant in the room here, which is media and popular culture that shapes perceptions of Americanism as a, 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 a and in terms of representation in popular media, um, and then also in terms of what a good immigrant is, or what a good American is or is not, in terms of popular media discussions. I mean, turn on news, uh, television news at any given time, and you don't need the, the form to say that these are the things that a good immigrant is. You get it because, you know, on the nightly news or on the, the cable news every night, they're, they're hitting that into the ground. So just wonder if you have any thoughts on what role does media, uh, media storytelling, journalism, popular culture play in this? And did any of your participants talk about media at all when they, w as these conversations continue? No, not explicitly, not like, oh, it's like what I see on Beverly Hills 9021, like, girl, I don't even know if Beverly Hills was still on back in 2006. <laughs> but like, okay, well, there we go. Um, so, you know, I think the answer to your question is yes, certainly it has to play a role. Like it has, and it like, and especially because what they're describing too isn't just like middle class; it's upper middle class often, right? So, and when you think of the portrayals on sitcoms and stuff, it's not a normal house; it's an abnormally nice house usually, right? So, I think it has to. Did they mention it? No. Did, did they? Well, that's not entirely true. There were a few teens, and these were usually teens um, who came from um, families where parents were professionals. So among the Chinese origin families and a few Vietnamese, but especially the Chinese origin families, we did try to get a wider representation of socioeconomic background because that is the reality on the ground. Um, and so we have a few teens who come from families where the parents are professionals, especially the US born, especially parents who are US born with US born kids. Um, and there were a few of those teens who explicitly mentioned Leave It to Beaver, which was bizarre because they could never have seen that episode, right? Like, I mean, like, I've never seen a Leave It to Beaver episode in my life. Um, and I, I highly doubt that they have, but that iconic image of what it means to be American. And so there were one or two teens who explicitly said in the same economic family kind of thing, when I think of American, and I wish I had the quote, but there's this yet yeah, one Chinese American woman who says, when I think of American, I think of the dad who works, the mom who stays at home, they live in a house, and everyone eats supper together. Another supper together thing. But also like gendered from the 1950s, and, and it's just, it's strange. Like we're in the 21st century, and, and that's the image. So I think the short answer to your question is yes. The longer answer is I don't know how much. Um, they did not explicitly, beyond those kind of really sort of interesting mentions, talk about it. Um, and I think you're absolutely right that 
people who are living, say, in some of the poor areas of Richmond and Oakland, they can literally look up the hills and see the nice houses there. Um, but they're not interacting with those people very much. Like most of the schools where we um, recruited uh, young people are highly segregated schools where it's Latino black. So uh, Kennedy High, Richmond High are almost entirely Latino black and one is more black, one is more Latino. In Oakland, same story. Um, so it's not the case that they're interacting with white middle class people, at least the teens, in their schools. Um, so yes, probably media place. I'm going to jump in and take my prerogative as, uh, as sitting up in front of the room and you can't see my hand. Uh, um, you mentioned that many of these schools are African American and Latino, yes. um, yet um, I didn't hear much about perceptions of African Americans who of course are so central to the ascriptive, the civic, the various definitions of citizenship that you've been describing. And um, I think about the work of Bobo and our colleague Neil Charles in Los Angeles or Wilson and Taub in Chicago. Um, talking to immigrants who define in part their identity as being n not black. Uh, and I'm wondering if you found any of this or um, in, in any of the issues with the different groups. Right, so this is another fail failure of my clairvoyance. Um, what I would have liked to do is after getting some of these answers about it's a white person, to have explicitly asked, what do you think about a black person in the United States? Are they American? Um, in a few cases, the interviewers, especially in the foreign language interviews, sort of followed up and, oh, what do you think about a black person? Um, and in, in the few cases that I have of that, the, the immigrants said, oh, yeah, they're American. So they, they, it was like, yeah, they're American. Now, this was in an abstract sense, not necessarily a common membership and we feel brotherly feeling to each other, but yes, they're American. Um, I think it does represent, though, that there's this racial hierarchy that, yes, they're American, but it's not the, the group that we think of. Um, the kids, we had a whole series of questions about what their school was like, what relations in the school were like, sort of how people hang out. And it was very mixed. Um, some people had friends, so if they were, it was mostly Latino, some Asian, some Vietnamese, because some of the Vietnamese lived in pretty poor areas where it was also pretty segregated schools with um, other minorities. Um, in some cases, they were like, yeah, I have lots of friends who are black and we hang out and there's no issues at all. And then in other cases, people were very much distancing and saying, no, I just hang out with the Latinos and, you know, we have fights and, and we don't interact much. I, I haven't gone through it carefully enough to have a clear feeling um, one way or another, but it didn't, it didn't jump out, let's put it that way. It didn't jump out either way. And I think both tension is evident as well as some sense of um, potential friendships. Now, this was on the teen level. Um, among the immigrant parents, um, what was interesting was that I had one interviewer who um, spoke fluent Spanish. She had lived for many years in Mexico, but she was Jewish, white American. And when she did her interviews, the Mexican parents talked much more about um, racial distance between themselves and black people, and talked much more about their problems with black people. Um, and when the Latino interviewers interviewed, so these were people um, mostly of Mexican origin, first or second generation, um, there was very little. And I don't understand entirely why. Like, I'm not sure if the Mexican respondents were saying this to the white interviewer because they thought this was appropriate, um, and why it wouldn't be appropriate if it was someone of your same background. Um, but it wasn't striking. Now, maybe I didn't ask enough questions about it, because a lot of the interview schedules mostly focus on the political and civic socialization. All right, how to hand the back. Um, Paul and you, I, I, I come from the Humboldt University in Berlin, so I just jumped here some couple of weeks ago, and my first experience was in the, in the office when I had to have this so, sec, not, say, social security number, and I should cross what I am, um, and I leave it blank because there are many categories that I think I could be everything. Um, so the question is, how do these people deal with this kind of classification and census? Do they put <coughs> Latino or Asian or do they leave it blank? So they refuse to, to take this category for themselves. The other question that I have, did you compare the answers with the, with the answers of 
white Americans to the same questions? No. Um, <laughs> because I, I have a feeling, it's just an intuition, that they probably will be very similar. Right. Um, um, so in terms of your second question, no, I don't have sort of the white American control group. Um, there's a paper uh, that I wrote with Natasha Wariku um, at Harvard where what we did is she has interviews with elite college students at Ivy League universities, at unnamed Northeastern universities. Um, and she interviewed these elite students who, most of them were white, but not all of them. Some of them were people of color. And she asked the same questions about what does it mean to be an American. Um, and we compared the answers she got among the elite college students to the answers that I got among these teenagers. So they're different ages and they're different socioeconomic statuses, plus there's the immigration question. And one of the things that we found that was different is that the elite college students talked about American as being about opportunities much more. They had much more this language of being American is about opportunities, and often economic opportunities, not solely, and it was about making the most of it. And they, would, they, would, they had a very sort of meritocratic, um, uh, positive view of the United States. And they also talked a lot about multiculturalism was good, diversity was good, being American means you can be from anywhere. So they had an incredibly inclusive language of being American. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, do they truly believe it? Maybe. Um, you know, they're sort of the elite of the elite who are at the Ivies. Um, and what we did in the paper was we contrasted their view of economic opportunity being open and American to the kids who see it as exclusion and they're not part of it. Um, but I did not have similarly situated kids living in the same area of the same age group to compare to in terms of the whites. In terms of checking off boxes, I didn't explicitly ask the question, like given a census form, what do you check off? Um, based on the data I know um, in California, for example, in the, what used to be the US Census and now the American Community Survey, um, Latino is not a race. It might be a race coming forward, but right now it's not a race, it's an ethnicity, and then there's race. Um, for California young people, Latino is a race. Yeah. And they will check it off as a race, and they will say it as a race. Um, and, and when I show them the census form, and I say, no, it's not a race, they're like, what are you talking about? And, and they get very upset about it. Um, so, you know, but I could direct you to other work that has done it more systematically than I. Like Mary Waters has some nice work where she looks at like what you actually check off a box and then sort of what people say qualitatively. There was a question in the back, and I'll go to Rogers. No? Um, yeah, I, I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about uh, your conclusions about birthright citizenship. In particular, you begin by talking about ascriptive citizenship and consensual citizenship. And it seems, as, as you state, that birthright citizenship can be framed theoretically as a matter of ascription or ascriptive citizenship. But on the ground, your research is, I think, um, what you're arguing. Uh, it seems that it's acting as a way to sort of combat that description, that it's, it has a more egalitarian um, purpose, or at least in practice, it has, um, it's, it's kind of um, supporting this idea of citizenship as um, I have a claim to citizenship regardless of these ethnic or these racial stereotypes that I also hold. Um, is, is what you're finding. And so I would, I would be curious to hear a little bit more about that final claim about birthright citizenship or your, or your conclusions. And then also if there's a difference between um, the Chinese and the Vietnamese um, immigrants or the children that you're interviewing versus the Mexicans, especially since there's so much public policy and sort of cultural backlash against Mexican immigrants at the moment, it strikes me that that, that might play an important factor in terms of what, how people are interpreting birthright citizenship and its significance to their own citizenship. So the, the second question is whether the uh, teens of Mexican origin put even more emphasis on the I was born here mm -hmm. than the Chinese or the Vietnamese origin teens? Absolutely, as a, because we're talking about legal status. So. Right. Um, the short answer to the second one was no. Okay. And I was surprised, um, in a way. But I think it's because, uh, Again, this is where I'm doing the analysis right now, so this is pretty tentative, but I think it's because the, the I was born here claim is doing different things for the two groups. Not entirely, but, but impartially. So for the people of Mexican origin, it is a claim, I was born here because when the white girl sees me, she sees me as a Mexican, 
and therefore excludes me. But when she sees me as a Mexican, that could mean all kinds of things, right? That could mean race, uh, that could potentially mean class, that could mean illegality, that could mean undocumented status. So there's a lot wrapped up there in terms of sort of the racialization of undocumented status. Um, and the I was born here is both a reaction against, don't think I'm undocumented, but it's also a reaction against, I can be included even if I'm brown. That there's sort of both of those things going on. The, the Vietnamese and the Chinese also did the I was born here. And, and, and it, was, it was just sort of this knee-jerk, well, being American, it's being born here, I'm born here. And, and sort of, but for them, there might be more of a layering of the acculturation. Um, and again, it's hard to tease out what people mean when they say, I was born here, and, and given we already had a long interview schedule, we didn't probe enough, there would have been all kinds of wonderful things we could have done. Um, so we didn't really get into like what exactly they meant, but I think it was both um, the claim against, sort of say, if you think of Mia Tuan's work about forever foreigner, so even third and fourth generation Asian American Californians, you know, getting very upset about, you know, where are you from? Well, I've been here, you know, I was born here, and my parents were born here, and my grandparents were born here. So it's, it's sort of a claim against the racial exclusion of not being white, but I think it's also a claim in a way of acculturation. I was born here, so therefore I know your norms, I can speak English without an accent, you know, I'm an American in these other ways. So both of them use I am born here. Um, but I think there might be somewhat different valences behind it. And you know, the hard part of the qualitative analysis is trying to tease out from the words I have my interpretation of what I think is going on. Um, in terms of the first question, you know, what, where does that leave us with birthright citizenship? I think you know, this is a normative question perhaps, or maybe it's not. Maybe it also has some empirical social science behind it. But I mean, I think I would make a very strong stance against things like repealing the 14th Amendment or trying to recast it as not being applicable to the children of undocumented immigrants or even temporary immigrants um, because I think it does have this sort of egalitarian absolutism that while it's ascriptive vis-a-vis -vis anyone not born in the United States because they get special privileges for them given that they feel potential exclusions based on class and race and then you know maybe some other characteristics it is sort of an absolute claim to inclusion that no one can question. Whereas like things like acculturation or length of residency or English language ability like in our naturalization exam are all subject to negotiation, contestation. Like, do you really know enough English? Like do you truly pass the civics exam? Whereas I was born here is like you can't challenge that. I was born here. So I guess that's where I come down. Rogers. Well, my question is uh, uh, related to that and uh, your Interview data may not give much you just said, maybe we just say much about it, but um, I'm interested more in hearing more about how they understand the uh, claim that birthright citizenship uh, represents. Uh, uh, you know, we talk birthright citizenship seems to um, sit uneasily between civic and ethnic conceptions, but one thing. I think your evidence clearly shows is that uh, academics may debate those categories. Uh, they have conceptions that mix civic and ethnic elements. Uh, so, um, uh, in a sense, um, uh, the fact that they can embrace birthright citizenship may not relate to civic ethnic so clearly. That doesn't. That's not a factor in their uh, thinking. Um, but there are a couple different. There are like three different conceptions of why birthright citizenship might seem compelling to them. One is the political defensive purpose, you know, precisely because we know there are these um, ethnic conceptions that may be used to deny my Americanism. I'm going to hold on to the fact that uh, uh, the legal system says if you're born here, you're a citizen, and that just can't be denied. And so that's a more sort of tactical, instrumental uh, uh, purpose. Um, uh, you just said, well, maybe being born here is important because it's a uh, surrogate for being uh, acculturated and socialized uh, here. Um, uh, but I wonder if there isn't uh, another kind of understanding uh, that is certainly in Western traditions and some Eastern, uh, uh, some Asian traditions, um, uh, that uh, there is a moral claim that comes just from the fact of being born in this place, on this soil, that makes you naturally a member of the community. Uh, this uh, understanding 
um, uh, has feudal roots, but older roots uh, too, and it's carried on in our term that when you become a citizen, you are naturalized. It is as if you were born uh, here. Um, uh, many societies have, uh, including Asian societies, have traditions of uh, family registry because the place of birth is somehow profoundly definitive of identity. Um, and uh, it represents a kind of uh, uh, a moral claim. I am naturally of this place because I was born here. And I wondered if you got any of that kind of sense or how they understood that. Um, uh, uh, is it just legal tactic? Is it just I'm enculturated? Or is there some other understanding of this somehow makes me naturally uh, one of these people? I don't know. Um, to be honest, I don't think almost any of our respondents were sufficient political theorists to have thought so carefully about what they were really meant. But that's not what I'm asking. No, I know. No, but I, I want to know, what if do they express some moral sense that, you know, being here, born here is particularly important to me? Uh, or is it is a source of a real, um, that just makes it right for me to be part I think some of the teens, I don't know if I would, maybe in a moral sense. I mean, I think the teens, in a way, were even, some some of them, were shocked by the question, or, or were so like, well, I guess I'm American, I was born here. Like they, it, it was, in a way, a moral claim, in that I don't think they were savvy enough to like know enough, but you know, I, I would be very interested to know how many of them could even tell me what the 14th Amendment was, I didn't ask them. Um, like I wonder how many of them know but what the they 14th Amendment is. Legal status. Yeah. Right, and and so they don't it could, yeah, that's what I would I would guess. But you know, I've had sociologists say really they don't know that, and I'm like, well, I don't know. So you know, this, this, this is sort of like how much of this idea of being born in the United States, which is based on the Constitution, is imbued in our culture in such an extent that you don't even have to know what the 14th Amendment says. You just know that in the United States, being born somewhere, and you know, clearly for those of them who have traveled. I think this is be, this has sort of gotten home to them when they had to get their passport, right? So passport, getting a passport when you suddenly have to have that document to show your birth certificate and then you get this document, that makes it real to them. But for many of them, they've never traveled. So, you know, there, I think there's a cultural legal sense of, of being American, which comes from the legal and the political, but I don't know if they would necessarily articulate that carefully. I think for some of the teens, though, that some of it was moral. Some of it was, I was born here in a moral sense of, you know, I am, I am part of this territory, this country, in, in some sense. Interestingly, among the parents, um, especially the Vietnamese and Chinese parents, um, their sense of identity was more blood-based, and they would use very explicit blood-based language in certain respects of like, I am Chinese, that is my blood, that is my race. I am Vietnamese, I, that is my blood, that is my race. So as much as in China you have you know, the village system of registration and you have to come from a village, at least for the ones in the United States when we were doing these interviews, it was, I mean, they sometimes talked about place, but it was really much more of an ancestry-based conception of identity. And so this is why we would sometimes get differences in the answers in terms of American and U.S. citizens, especially for like some of the naturalized US, uh, Vietnamese and Chinese, where they would be like, I am not American. You know, I am Chinese. That's my blood. That's my background. And, and it was a very sort of strong identity thing. But then if we ask, are you a U.S. citizen? Oh, yeah, of course I'm a U.S. citizen. And they'd be very proud of being a U.S. citizen. So that's where you would get some of this civic versus identity membership. The teens, it was all mixed up. They, they didn't have that strong, positive race-based ancestry feeling like their parents did. And at the same time, they had much more of a, a strong tie to the United States. And, and yeah. Thank you. So, uh, so it's really fascinating um, data, and it's it's terrific evidence at the micro level that there is this understanding that if you're born in the United States, you have citizenship, and it's quite an exceptional. Well, it's a relatively exceptional regime. And it's certainly exceptional to the Americas. So, in the European context, even in the Commonwealth countries now, you don't have um, absolute control by um, citizenship. So. It's interesting how it's filtered down among this population that's not necessarily sophisticated, doesn't know that it's the 14th Amendment. And good evidence for it at the political level is that notwithstanding a high level of anti-immigrant sentiment, 
politically, these proposals to scale back birthright citizenship have gone no nowhere. Yeah. I mean, they haven't even gotten voted out of committee at the same time that they get proposed in each session of Congress. But, but the Center yeah. of Immigration Studies keeps coming out with these little papers. Right. They, yeah. so, there's, so they'll get proposed in each right. success of Congress, but they're unlikely, no. they're unlikely to go anywhere. But, um, but I do wonder, and you've anticipated this to some extent, um, when they say, I'm American because I was born here, whether it's just that they're saying that they're from here. And the way you really control for that would be somebody who's born here and then is taken back to their parents' country of origin, where presumably you just wouldn't get this. Yeah, or they come get back the same later. Answer. It's, I mean, in an internal migration context, it would be somebody who's born in Boston and lives a year there and then moves and spends her childhood in New York is not going to say that they're from Boston because they were right. born there. So I don't know if, you, if there's some way you can control for that in, in, the, in your future, in future work. In the <laughs> yeah, no, not, I mean, not in this project. I mean, I think it would be really interesting to do this kind of work because I, I do think this sort of legal culture of birth in the United States, 14th Amendment, etc., cetera, is, is, is so powerful in the United States. And um, I do think it's interesting that culturally it has become such a knee-jerk answer for these teens who are, who are not that sophisticated. Um, and, you know, Canada is another country in the Americas who, still, who has absolute birthright citizenship. And I would, I would be interested in knowing whether the Canadian teens of immigrant parents would respond with this same knee-jerk, I was born in Canada. My intuition is no. Like, I think they would still say they're Canadian, but I don't think that they would have that birthright claim to the same extent, which gets back to that question about sort of communications and media. I mean, part of the, you know, why, why, why is the birthright so important? Because maybe as much as the right wing is attacking birthright citizenship in a way, the language of no, you can't do that, and, and maybe some of the, the legal debates around, well, you, you know, remember what we did with Chinese exclusion, or you can't do this, do you realize it came out of slavery and the Civil War? I, I mean, I have no idea how much that percolates into general culture, but there is sort of a power to that given the history of the United States, that in a country like Canada, where you do have absolute birthright citizenship, more or less, like in, in the United States, I don't think it has the same cultural power. Now, I don't have the data to support that contention, um, but it would be interesting. Uh, and I think it would be interesting also to do it in the European context because my understanding of the little ethnographic data that I've seen on some of this is that you know people in the Netherlands or people in Germany who are maybe second generation and might even have citizenship, they will tend to make claims more based on the city they belong to. So like I'm I'm an Amsterdam or I don't know if it sounds weird in English, but uh, or you know I'm from Berlin, but they wouldn't necessarily say I'm Dutch without any. Or, or I'm, I'm German necessarily, maybe. But th there's not the same sort of claim. There's a place-based place, place -based claim in the city, which is more about acculturation and familiarity and everything. So I don't have an answer to you, but it would be an interesting research project in terms of comparing. And then in terms of the, you know, what does it mean to someone who was born there for a year, went away, and then has very few ties? I don't know. I can give you one n of two anecdotal based on my own d dear children um, so my children have three citizenships all through birth um, they have dutch citizenship through their mother's blood uh, they have canadian citizenship through their father's blood and then mine i guess sort of in a weird way um, and then they have american citizenship because they were born in the united states while i was a temporary immigrant so my children would be stripped of their citizenship for some of these people um, so maybe I'm not a neutral observer. Um, but, you know, like, when they talk about their sense of belonging, it's, it's a very nuanced way of talking about it. And for them, it does matter that they have these passports and everything. Now, it could be because their mother studies this, and so they have a you know, heightened sensitivity to this. But, like, when we were watching the Olympics, I asked them, who do you cheer for? And they were like, 
wow. And so my youngest was like, well, the Amer America first, because I was, you know, I was born here. He said that. I was born here, and this is where I grew up. But then after that, Canada, because all of our families in Canada, and then the Dutch, because I guess you're sort of Dutch. And then he threw in the French, just because we speak French at home. Um, and, and then for my other child, he didn't even want to be American. So he was like, no, no, I don't want to cheer for the Americans. I'll cheer for the Canadians first, and then maybe the Dutch and the French, and then maybe the Americans. But if they're playing hockey, then it's the Canadians. So, you know, I, I don't know what that means, but I do think that it creates some possibility of a tie. Um, that's a very unscientific ending to our discussion. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Eileen for this really stimulating presentation and uh, uh, the Social Science and Policy Forum is meant to bring social scientists who can speak across disciplinary boundaries to larger public issues and this was an exemplar of that approach. So thank you very much. Uh, I want to remind you that uh, tomorrow we will be having a noontime in...